Lord. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, here we thank you for another opportunity to come. Lord, we pray as we come together. Lord, we come thanking you for the gospel by which we are saved, and that is that Jesus Christ died, that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. We thank you for your holy word, uh, and we pray as we study tonight that we will be encouraged tonight in your word, and not only encouraged, that we will be enlightened by the effectual working of the Holy Spirit. And that when we come away from your word tonight, that we will be edified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to go ahead and get into our lesson tonight. My brothers and sisters, <clears throat> we've been talking about God ordained government, and we're going to get there. But uh, accountability, I was sitting and, and studying. I talked to my pastor today, and I talked to another preacher, and we talked about some things today. Um, there's, I think folks have forgot about, there's going to be accountability in God's work. Uh, Paul told the Galatians, believers in Galatians 4, 15, 4, 16, have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? I don't mind becoming an enemy for standing on the word of truth rightly divided. Let me say that again. I don't mind becoming an enemy for standing on the word of truth rightly divided. Uh, let me say this before we get going tonight. We should never look down on those who are without Christ, living in sin and rebellion against God. We should never look down on them. After all, we have read the Bible when it says that before we came to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we were equally guilty of sin and rebellion against God. And even as Christians, we feel the urge to rebel against God's word. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's Romans 3.23. Uh, remember these verses. That goes for Christians too. The Lord Jesus did not die for goody goodies. I hope folks understand that. Uh, the only people for whom Christ died were lost people, ungodly people, sinners, enemies of God. Who is that? That's every one of us. The only person God can save is a sinner, and we must remember that, my brothers and sisters. Remember, um, let's remember whatever people we meet who are struggling with various sins, let us remember. As such were some of us, um, my brothers and sisters. So tonight, believe the gospel. Tonight, and that is Jesus died, was buried, and rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures, uh, my brothers and sisters. And uh, we should always remember that, that we never have a place to look down on others. We ought to thank God that we have been saved by the grace of God. Now, outside of that good news that I just read, let me say this, and there is accountability in God's work. Now, in Genesis 3, verse 9, and the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Now, the Lord God knew where Adam was. So why did he ask that question? Again, Bible critics often stumble over this verse and claim it is silly for God to be inquiring about Adam's whereabouts. Now, these critics overlook two valuable pieces of information. Now, this verse contains doctrine that only a Bible believer can notice and appreciate. Firstly, by asking Adam, where I die, the Lord was prompting thoughts in Adam's mind. Upon hearing God's voice, Adam immediately thought, I should be fellowshipping with him. I should be right by his side. But look at me, fearful and hiding amongst the trees. My relationship with him is severed. Second, secondly, nothing is hidden from God's sight. God is all known. He knew exactly where Adam was hiding and why he was hiding. Proverbs 15 and 3. Proverbs 15 and 3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Now, by asking Adam, where are thou? The Lord is, the Lord is bringing Adam to the place of accountability. Adam is forced to confess that he is hiding from God because he blatantly disobeyed God's commandment. He has eaten the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And so as any sinner does, he hides from the holy God of creation. God asked Adam and Eve four questions in Genesis 3, 8 through 13. Questions who answers he knew. He asked them all to bring Adam. He asked them to bring Adam and Eve to accountability. We want to briefly look at these four questions, how God prompt answer from Adam and Eve to cause them to realize just what they had done. Question one, and the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, where I thou? Prompt answer, Adam's reply. And he said, I heard thou voice in the garden 
and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Question two to Adam, and he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree? Wherefore I command thee that thou should not eat of. Prompt answer. And the man said, The woman who thou gavest to me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. You want to know where blaming started from? Look right there. Well, we want to point fingers instead of taking responsibility for ourselves. If anything we want answer to, I tell folks, go to the Bible and you will get your answer, my brothers and sisters. Now, question four to Eve. And the Lord said unto the woman, what is thou hast done? Prompt answer. And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. There we go. She pointed to the serpent. Uh, it, is it not interesting that the Bible critics asked about the first question, but never bothers to see the other three questions? The point is that God asked not one, but four questions to which he already knew the answers. Again, he was doing this for the sake of Adam and Eve, not for himself. Even today, we all, even Bible critics, ask questions to which we already know the answer. Let go some questions for those in the body of Christ tonight. And I want you to catch on to these and listen to them. Here goes some questions tonight. Am I become your enemy? Because I tell you the truth. How come I don't study God's word like I should? Why do I continue to get tossed to and fro and carried away by every wind of doctrine? Why haven't I grown spiritually? How come I don't know the word of God rightly divided like I should? How come I can... I can't, I can't present the plan of salvation to a lost soul. Why haven't I been doing good works? How come I don't redeem the time when it presents itself? How come I haven't participated in the spiritual battle that's going on? Why do I rely on man for my spiritual development and growth? Why am I walking around functionally dead? How come I don't take the judgment seat of Christ serious? Many know the answer to these questions. These questions should provoke us to a self-examination of ourselves and help us to realize that there is accountability in God's work. My brothers and sisters, God, through his powerful word, is asking many in the body of Christ, Where are thou? Why have you turned away from the truth to fables? And why aren't you enduring sound doctrine? Why have you allowed yourself to be carried away by every wind of doctrine? Why have you forsaken the word of the ministry for the love of this world? The love of the world and the love of God and the love of Father and, and the Father cannot coexist. Let me say that again. The love of the world and the love of God the Father cannot coexist. Second Timothy, you go and read that. Paul talks about what it's going to look like in the last days. In Second Timothy, in, in, uh, Second Timothy three and verse five, he said, "Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof." Paul describes not only the terrible fallen character of the mass of people coming in the last days in the body of Christ, but also the apostate church. They keep the outward form of the so-called Christianity, having services, singing, referring to Jesus, but as on a par with other noble men, they deny the power of God, not believing in the power of God to save and change lives. Paul says, what you will see in the last days of the body of Christ the church is how many will rely upon man and man's methods to fix the world. Humanism, psychology, social engineering, and politics. They try to make the world just fair and nice through their effort to make known the version of a social gospel, which is not the gospel of grace of God at all. Their faith is in man, not in God. And this is the core of humanism. Their faith is in man. It's an evil substitute for reliance upon God. The true, true church today possesses his life and power to overcome sin and death by faith in his cross work. Sadly, quite often the Sunday church attendees prefer having an intermediate class of religious leaders, a clergy serving between them and the Lord. The clergy system that prevailed today is distortion of God's structure that was designed for the pure edification building up of the members of the church which is his body. Many people desire the clergy as a mediatorial religious class so they would not have to endure a personal one-on-one -on -one 
heartfelt relationship with the Lord. Thus they accept these corrupted church leaders we see among us today. Of course, Paul says, we today have no intermediary except Christ Jesus himself. Read Romans 8, 34. And then 1 Timothy 2, 5. Paul said, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. As the apostasy rises all about us and those who stand for God's truth are often ridiculed and despised. May, give God, may God give us the grace to stand true regardless of the cost. Remember that any suffering for Christ are only temporary while the rewards will be eternal. Faithful or unfaithful, each of us will be given account of himself to God, not for our sins which have been forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ, read Ephesians 1, 7, but for how we built on the foundation that was laid. For our works in this service, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. That's what Ephesians 2.10 tells us. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. And Romans 2.6, who will render to every man according to his deeds. And Romans 14.12, so then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Many Christians have gone for years with a complete lack of understanding and are totally unprepared for this judgment, having no knowledge of even what is required. Few ministers preach on the judgment seat of Christ, and most Christians don't study the subject for themselves. On judgment day, Christians in the body of Christ will have no excuse with all the resources available to us, with all the teaching and all the preaching that we hear so on, on Sundays and that we hear in Bible studies and, and, and uh, uh, phone ministries and, and all these things that we hear, there will be no excuses when we stand at the judgment seat of Christ. All saints in the body of Christ will be judged on the basis of their deeds and service. Many believe they can live their lives holding hands with the world and still be fully rewarded, not suffering any loss. First Corinthians 3, 8, every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Notice the word own in that verse, his own reward according to his own labor. Our wood, hay, and stubble will all be burned up on that day. The endless hours of watching television, reading meaningless books, and various other pleasurable pursuits will be burned up that day and will cause us to lose rewards for eternity. Our good works, which we did to be seen by other people, will all be burned up as well. Meanless trips to a building to hear confusion and follow out with the traditions and commandments of men will all be burned up. Listening to and following what man says instead of following what the word of truth rightly divided says. Colossians 3, 23 through 25. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance. For you serve the Lord Christ. But he that does wrong shall receive for the wrong which he has done. And there is no respect a person. In other words, no favoritism going to be shown. These verses speak about all relationships. And most important thing is that we are serving the Lord. And whatever thing we are doing, we are to do it for the Lord. In other words, it's the motive. We are not doing it to be seen or to be popular and, and to receive recognition from men. But we are doing it as unto the Lord. Some folks want to get up and sing a song, especially when the, when the, when the, when the assembly is crowded because they want to be seen. Other times when the assembly ain't crowded, they don't, they don't even think to want to sing a song. But when the assembly is crowded, they, want to, they see all the folks looking in. My brothers and sisters, what's your motive? Colossians gives us the same message. 
But as a verse, he that does wrong shall receive for the wrong which he has done, and there is no respect, like I said, a person. The wrong being spoken of here is not sin. From studying these verses, I believe it's that which we have done and used in our life which has implicated the gospel in a negative sense. Something to, dis something to disturb the, the unity of the body of Christ. Christians don't mind talking about the good they will receive, but it's upsetting to hear that the believer who has used his influence wrongly will receive that also. Some Christians are astonished to learn that God also keeps that record. Paul says in Romans 12 to the believer, don't try to take vengeance for yourself because vengeance is God. He will repay. When other believers have been offensive, when they have not controlled their speech and have caused harm to others, God says, don't take personal vengeance. I have that in an account. Believers will receive the wrong which they have done at the judgment seat of Christ. Romans 12, 19, avenge not yourself, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will pray, said the Lord. Those who are born the heat of the battle, following their Lord, will not stand on the same plane as those who avoided the battle. Some folks haven't even entered the spiritual battle, but it's a spiritual battle going on. They done got saved and they done sat down. They won't have nothing when it comes to the judgment seat of Christ. They got to give an account. Each will be rewarded according to his own labor. When we stand before his judgment seat, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort. Talking about the judgment of God. We will be stand before the Lord to receive the things done in our, your body, our body, according to that you has done. Whether it be good or bad. 2 Corinthians 5.10 We want to stand before him. With the confidence of the Apostle Paul, who after fought a good fight, having finished his course, having kept the faith, he could write to Timothy, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, should give me at that day, and not to me only. He's not thinking about himself, he's thinking about others. He said, Not to me only, but unto all of them also that love his appearance. 2 Timothy 4 8, the position of service will hold in eternity. And how we serve God forever will be determined by the choices we make and how we live in this life right now. What are you doing for Christ, my brothers and sisters? God's reward shows approval that our life on earth has been useful and pleasing to Him. You got to answer your question. That question tonight is your life pleasing to God? Christians who are Christians who are useful to God here will be given greater opportunities to be useful to Him throughout eternity. Those who will be rich in heaven are those who do not live to impress people, but they live to bless others here on all earth, and in so doing, they delight the heart of God. First Corinthians fifteen fifty eight. Be steadfast, unmovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, for you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. How we have lived this brief life will carry eternal consequences. Few Christians have a real vision of eternity. While heaven is the place where everyone wants to go, their, their lives reflect the attitude of but not yet. But not yet. Many are too busy pursuing the temporal things of this world and thousands of lost people are entering eternity with Satan and his angels daily. The judgment seat of Christ is obviously going to be a time of great embarrassment and shame for many Christians. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thou self approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Notice it says, show thou self approved unto God. And then it says, a workman that needed not to be ashamed. There will be many at the judgment seat of Christ that will be ashamed. A saved soul, but a wasted life. 
Let me say that again. A saved soul, but a wasted life. Many got saved and they didn't just sit down. But there is accountability in God's work. There would be some people who we thought were great, big, highly favored and used of God in great ways. And we are going to see them with little. Even though multitudes supposedly came for salvation and so forth, this would be because their motive has reduced their work. We're going to hear about the heroes of heaven. And some of those people are going to be people we may, we may have, never, have never heard of, my brothers and sisters. But they walked in total faithfulness to the purpose that God put before them. They were focused consistent and biblical in their motives and in their spirit and live their life in complete fellowship with Christ. So the question, I won't get to my God ordained the government. We're going to finish that up. But sometime when you study, you go another avenue. We went another avenue tonight because I want to let folks know as much going on in the world, don't lose focus. My brothers and sisters, there's accountability in God's word. There's accountability. God's going God's to gonna see how many times you had an opportunity to present the, to, the, the salvation to a lost soul and you just, you, just, you just swandered it away because of the temporary things in life. God sees that. Every time you think God, God, God died for all. It is his will that all men be saved. And come unto the knowledge of truth, my brothers and sisters. God don't want to see no one perish and, and end up in eternal damnation. But every time that we, 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 we swander away this opportunity that we have, we got to remember that one day we got to stand before the righteous judge. One day we're going to give an account of all the deeds that, I didn't say that's the word of God saying that of all the deeds done in this old body. My brothers and sisters, there is accountability in God's word. That's, that's, that's what, 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 what went on when I was studying this. That I, I think folks didn't forgot what God is doing today. My brothers and sisters. So remember. There's accountability in God's word. And we will pick up on God a dang government because we got some great information in the rest of that, that, that message also that I want us to have. My brothers and sisters, remember that tonight. Let us pray. Father, here we thank you for your word. And we pray as those who listen in that they remember that we don't just get saved to sit down. There are many lost souls, millions and millions of lost souls that are dying every day going to eternal damnation because they haven't believed the gospel of their salvation. And we as saints in the body of Christ, we must be about our father's business also. My, my brothers and sisters, Lord, help us understand as brothers and sisters in Christ, that it is serious business when we talk about eternity. So Lord, let us be more concerned about the spiritual things than the temporary things in life. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.